I remember my first year at Camp Dudley, Christian camp, uh, just uh, up on, off of Highway 12, up there by uh, uh, White Pass. I was in fourth grade. Matter of fact, I think uh, Virgil Stonecipher was one of my counselors that year. Us fourth grade boys were in the Shin Lodge up above the chapel area, and I remember that we were chosen early on in the week to do a skit during the chapel time. And we loved the story of Jonah, so we wanted to do Jonah. And uh, guess who got to be Jonah? I got chosen to be Jonah. And I was excited about that. I didn't know what it all entailed at the time, but I found out quickly. Uh, three of my friends got to be the whale, which consisted of a sleeping bag unzipped and draped over the file line. And, and the guy at the front, of course, he was the head of the whale. He got to choose where the whale would swim through the auditorium, in between the aisles, between the rows of seats, and, and around uh, the different areas there. And the two guys in the back of the whale, uh, one of them had a can of shaving cream, and the other one had a roll of toilet paper. You can see where this is going. So I was up there uh, on, the, on the stage, and that was the ship, and my other friends from the cabin threw me off into the uh, raging sea, and here came the whale and swallowed me up, and uh, my two friends in the back of the whale proceeded shaving cream and toilet paper. And then the whale spit me out onto dry land, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to Nineveh. And that was our skit. Kids love the story of Jonah, right? I mean, it's uh, just a great fish story. But you know, some skeptics doubt this story. How can this be true? I mean, how, how is it possible for a human to survive three days inside a giant fish? And what kind of fish could even swallow a person whole? A big one. <laughs> Actually, there are documents too that I know of, of people being swallowed whole by a, a giant sea creature and surviving to tell the tale. And there are a number of large sea creatures, even today in our oceans, with mouths and throats large enough to swallow a whole person. But on the other hand, it doesn't matter if this is naturally possible according to the laws of nature. Because the book of Jonah tells us, Jonah 1.17 tells us this was a miracle. This was an act of God. It, it says the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord, you know, the one who created the entire universe. If God can create everything out of nothing, this miracle in the book of Jonah is small potatoes for God. I mean, he could do this. Okay, God is capable of providing a fish and, and having Jonah survive this out to tell the story. Sometimes I think people are so focused on the great sea monster in the book of Jonah that they miss the great savior in the book of Jonah. That's really the point of the book. We only got two verses in this entire book that talk about the, the great fish. But the whole book, savior, Jesus is the great savior in the book of Jonah. And if we believe Jesus, we got to believe the book of Jonah. Because Jesus believed in the book of Jonah. I mean, and more than once, Jesus talks about Jonah. In Matthew 12 and in Matthew 16, Jesus talks about what Jesus says about Jonah in Matthew 12, verses 38 through 41. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see what? A miraculous sign from you. See, they didn't believe in Jesus, and they wanted proof. They wanted to see a miraculous sign. Jesus answered, a wicked in it for a miraculous sign. But none will be given it except the sign of who? The prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will judge it with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. Jesus believed the book of Jonah. 
He believed that Jonah was an actual historical person, really was a prophet in the 8th century, who really was swallowed by a huge fish, and then three days later, he came out and lived to tell the tale. And he really did go to Nineveh, and he really did preach to the people there, and they really did repent. Furthermore, Jesus said that this was a miraculous sign from the sign. He said, you want a sign? Here it is, Jonah. And he does that more than once. He also does that in, in Matthew 16. This is the sign. And he says that this sign was a sign pointing people to the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He said, just as Jonah was in the three days and three nights, the Son of Man's going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. This was a prediction Jesus was making about his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead three days later. This is the message of the gospel. He said that this event, this miracle in the life of Jonah was pointing us to the God, the great Savior. That's the great message of this book. Something greater than Jonah is here. And, and he, he looked at those religious leaders who refused to believe in him, those religious leaders who refused to accept him as the Messiah, as, as the Savior of the world, those religious leaders who refused to accept him as the Son, refused to repent, who refused to follow Jesus as their Lord. And he said, you know what? Those pagan Gentiles of Nineveh of the 8th century, they're going to stand up on the day of judgment and condemn you for not accepting me as your Lord and Savior. Because they were now something far greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is much greater than Jonah. And Jesus is here. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. And he promised us that he'd be with us always, even to the very end of the age. He is here with us today. We have his word in scripture in us. And we have the preaching of Jesus. If, if the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, how much more should we repent at the preaching of Jesus today? Someone greater than Jonah is here. Today I want to share with you the gospel of the book, and I want to look at how Jesus is greater than Jonah. Of course, Jesus is greater than Jonah in many ways, but I want to share with you three ways in the book of Jonah that we see Jonah pointing us to Jesus and showing us how Jesus is greater than Jonah. That Jonah ran away from God's will, but Jesus came to do God's will. The author of Hebrews says that, that Jesus came and that it's written in the scroll, in the book, I came to do your will, O God. And there in the garden, before he was arrested, Jesus was in agony to go through, taking on the sins of the world, the shame and the punishment for our sin. And he prayed to the Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but what? Your will be done. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Jesus were given difficult missions to accomplish. But unlike Jesus, Jonah ran away from God's will. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship, and he got on board at that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard, and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God will give us a mission. He'll give us a command. He'll give us his will. And it's not going to be something we want to do. And we're going to face this same temptation. We're going to want to flee from the presence of the Lord. We're going to want to go away from God's will in our lives. And that's going to be a huge temptation for us. We want to do God's will. Jonah ran away from God's will. God told Jonah to go on a mission trip to Assyria and preach against the capital city of Nineveh. And Jonah refused to obey God's will. Many preachers will describe Jonah as this rebellious sinner he was. He was running away from God. But we need to remember that many times we're in the same boat with Jonah. Many times we hear the will of God in our lives and we want to run away. And we get on that boat 
for Tarshish to get away from this obligation that God has placed. I think I got a better plan for my life. No offense, but I'm going the other way. And if we think about it, if we were in Jonah's sandals and God told us to do what he told Jonah to do, most of us would probably do the same thing Jonah did. What was going on here? See, Nineveh was a great city in more ways than one. It was a huge city, over 600,000 people, maybe even a million people, but it was great also in its military power, in its brutality, in its violence. And they were the enemies of God's people, they were the enemies of Israel. Uh, Jonah was a prophet. He knew empire, an empire that would probably come and eventually destroy Israel. He knew the direction that Israel was going, that it was only a matter of time before God would send a nation to come and destroy Israel, and he knew it was probably going to be Assyria, and he knew what kind of brutal and vicious violence the Assyrians would carry out. Nineveh was located in what is now northern Iraq, not far from the city of Mosul. These were the ancestors of ISIS and the Taliban. And the, the terrorism we see today was nothing compared to the terrorism of the... This is a description of one of their kings, Ashurbanipal. And this was a typical description of what they would do when they would come in and punish a, a country, a nation that was rebelling against the empire. He writes, the heads of their warriors I cut off and were against their own city. Their young men and their maidens I burned in fire. I built a pillar over against their city gates and I flayed all the chief men who rebelled, revolted against me. And I covered the pillar with their skins. Some of them I walled up with the pillar on stakes and others I bound on stakes around about the pillar. See, this was an intimidation tactic. This was like a billboard for all the people to see, announcing this is what happens to people who rebel against the empire. Sense of justice. He knew this brutality and violence must be punished. But if he preached to Nineveh, they might repent. And if they repent, God might forgive them. Jonah didn't want God to forgive them. Jonah wanted God to destroy them. So Jonah, from God, and away from his responsibilities as a prophet of God. Jonah got on a ship bound for Tarshish. Scholars say that Tarshish was a, uh, uh, a colony of Phoenicia on the southwest shore of Spain. That's a long ways away, over to the direction of Nineveh. In those times, this was the farthest that they knew of. So that's what Jonah's saying. I'm going to get as far away from my responsibility as possible. But no matter how far you go, you can't. Verses 4 through 6 says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he laid down the captain, went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. These pagan Gentile sailors knew that this was no ordinary storm. These were sailors. They knew what storms were like on the Mediterranean Sea. And there was something about this supernatural. This was not a typical natural storm. This was an act of some God. And they all were convinced that they needed to start praying. They all became very religious all of a sudden. Everyone, whoever your God is, start praying to that God. The contrast emphasized throughout the book concerning the spiritual sensitivity of the pagan Gentiles and the hard-hearted stubbornness of this prophet of God who refuses to repent of his racism, who refuses to, to follow the will of God. Jonah had no concern for the rest of the world. He'd rather die in a storm at sea than go to Nineveh. And at first, he shows absolutely no concern for the Gentile sailors on the ship with him. He doesn't care if they die too. 
as Christians, we need to turn for our community. Even for, for those neighbors who believe differently than we do, we need to show a sincere compassion and concern for the community that we're a part of because our compassion, our concern for the people around us, even those who are different from us, is a testimony to the God of God. In Jonah 1, verses 7 through 10, it says, The sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, they interrogated him, for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? <laughs> Barrage of questions. He answered, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord. Notice the word Lord there is all capitals. L-O-R-D are all in capital letters. That means it's not just any God. The God of the Hebrews. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that Jonah is called by to be a prophet. And Jonah describes him as the God of heaven who made the sea in the land. <laughs> the sea that's raging against us right now. Yeah, that God. And they asked, what are you they knew that he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Notice how these pagan Gentiles become even more terrified when they realize that this is a prophet of Yahweh, the one who created the sea. And, and, and they're, they're up of the Lord is running away from the Lord. How can you do that? That was crazy to them, and it was crazy. He should have known better. You, how can a prophet run away from the Lord? And Jonah did know better. But you know what? Sometimes our sin causes us to do crazy things. Sometimes our, our hatred for others impairs our judgment and causes us to even do things like run away from God. Some of you might be running away from the Lord. Maybe you're frustrated because of all the waves of the ocean one after another. Maybe you're just spiritually asleep in the bows of the ship like Jonah was, not realizing that God is trying to get your attention. Maybe you don't want to do what the Lord needs to come to your senses. You need to wake up and realize that the Lord is not punishing you because He hates you. He's calling you because He loves you. He has a good plan for you. He has a blessing for you. He has a purpose for you. He's calling you to come back to Him. Paul put it this way in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to come back to God. That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm. Hold to the teachings we've passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by the letter. Like Jonah, you've been chosen by God. You've been called through the gospel to be saved and to be sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. So how should we respond? Hold on to these teachings the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. We have the preaching of Jesus. How much more should we repent of? Don't run away from God. Jesus is much greater than Jonah because Jesus accepted God's will. And even when it cost him everything, he went to the cross because of his love for us, because of his love for you. Another way that but Jesus, Jesus sacrificed himself for all sinners. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Oh, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. It'll become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you all. Neither Jonah nor the sailors were anticipating a giant fish to come swallow Jonah and take him safely to shore. 
That was not in their minds. There were only two possibilities that they were thinking of at this point. Either we all die, or we throw... That was perfectly acceptable to Jonah. I mean, Jonah, he, he tells them what they need to do in order to be saved, but he's, he's passive. He's apathetic. He doesn't jump in the water himself. His main concern is that he doesn't go to Nineveh. And he knows if he's dead, he doesn't have to go to Nineveh. <laughs> Problem solved. That's all he cares about. Verses 13 through 16. Instead, they could not, but the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord. Who are they crying to now? Oh, look at this. Notice it's all capitals. And notice how many times the name Yahweh appears in this passage. They cry to the Lord, O oh Lord, do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered sacrifice. No matter how hard they rode, they could not save themselves. And so they turned to Yahweh, the Lord, for salvation. And notice that these pagan Gentiles are no longer praying to their own gods. They've had a conversion experience. They've left their pagan idol, the one true God, and they're coming to him for salvation. And when God answers their prayer, they respond by worshiping the Lord, sacrificing to the Lord, making commitments, vows to the Lord of faithfulness. We see in this book that the preaching of Jonah, Jonah, but because of the gospel, because of the message of salvation through God's grace. Jonah was thrown into the raging sea of God's wrath, and as a result of that sacrifice, the sailors were saved. And that is a picture of the gospel. It's a thrown into the sea of God's raging wrath when he went to the cross for our sin. And that appeased the wrath of God. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 3. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to his parents. He had left the sins beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, the only way that God can truly be just and punish every single sin ever committed and grace is for he himself to take all sin, all punishment for every sin upon himself at the cross in the person of Jesus. That is the sacrifice. The sailors knew that they had been saved by grace. They didn't deserve this. And they responded by making vows of commitment and faithfulness to the Lord. And when we think about the sacrifice Jesus went through for us, we should have that same uh, desire, that same motivation. The Lord, turn away from our sin. John says in 1 John chapter 2, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice of the whole world. He's greater than Jonah because he is the sacrifice for the sins of all sinners. Jesus is also greater than Jonah because Jonah preached with no compassion, but Jesus preached with great compassion. This is the word of the Lord came down a second time. Jonah responds a little differently this time. Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required, and he proclaimed, for Nineveh will be overturned. That's a short sermon. 
It's only eight words long in English, five words in Hebrew. And look at what he doesn't say. He doesn't say anything about repentance. He doesn't say anything about forgiveness, mercy, redemption, or restoration. It's all about judgment and destruction, condemnation. Jonah doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want to show them that there is a way to get out of this. He doesn't want to show them that there's a way to change, be destroyed. He says, yeah, 40 more days you're going to be destroyed. And this is a prophetic word from the Lord. And, and he really believes that it's true. It is true. This is true. But he doesn't realize how it's true. Jonah, in his own words, he doesn't return to two meanings. And Jonah meant it as destruction. And it can mean, the, the, the word is hafak, it can mean a destruction of a city. It's the word used in, in Genesis 19 to, to describe Sodom and Gomorrah being overturned. I mean, if Nineveh. But it can also mean a spiritual transformation. It's the same word used in 1 Samuel 10 when King Saul was overturned by the Holy Spirit and changed into a different person. And that's the kind of overturning in Nineveh. And that's the kind of overturning God wants to accomplish in us. He wants to change us from the inside out. And that, that's what happened. The whole city turned away from their sins. They humbly cried out to God for mercy. And even the king made a, a royal proclamation. He said, By the decree of flock, taste anything, not to eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. He did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Even though Jonah preached a harsh message of judgment and destruction, he had no compassion, yet he was hoping for an opportunity to show compassion. If these evil, wicked, violent Assyrians would turn and repent, he would show them compassion and give them salvation. But look how Jonah responds when God gives these people compassion and mercy. In chapter 4, he became angry, prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was still at home? That's why I so quickly fled to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. Now, O oh Lord, just take my life. This death wish thing going on. Take it all the way to the end of the book. Jonah's angry at God because God showed grace to people who didn't deserve it. Some of you are picking up on that. It's not grace if we deserve it. We need to realize that none of us deserve it. We're all in the same boat. Just, just by this implication, Jonah is saying, I deserve God's grace. They don't. All of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Grace is grace because it's not deserved. I'm so glad that Jesus preaches a message of good news with great compassion. Matthew chapter 9. Healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, with great compassion. The people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah with no compassion. How much more should we repent at the preaching of Jesus with great compassion? He's calling us through the message of the gospel. Jonah and Jonah disobeyed the Lord. 
But just as the Lord called Jonah, the Lord calls us. With great compassion, the Lord calls us to put our faith in him, to turn away from our sins, to be baptized into Christ. With great compassion, the Lord calls us to be workers in our field. How do we respond to the preaching of Jesus? As the praise team comes at this time to lead us in a closing song, think about the great compassion of Jesus. Someone far greater than anyone here. Will we respond with that same urgency that the people of Nineveh had? That same desire to follow the will of God. Jonah ran away from God's will. Jesus came to do God's will. Jonah for all sins, including us. Jonah preached with no compa- compassion, but Jesus calls us. He preaches to us with great compassion. How much more should we respond to Jesus with sincere repentance and a desire to do his will? Let's be singing. Our final song will be dismissed. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this uh, amazing message of the gospel, the message of your grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. God, we're so thankful for the, the preaching of Jonah, but even more than help us to respond to your word. Help us to run to your will and to do your will. Help us to recognize the great sacrifice Jesus made for us and to respond by, by repenting of our sins, by putting our faith in you, by messing with others. And I pray that just as Jesus proclaimed a message with great compassion, that you'd work through us to reach out to the people in our lives with great compassion to bring them to you. May you be glorified, honored, and praised. In Jesus' name, amen.